everyone, Alexa Dunn here, and today I am going to be giving you tips for underwriters. I already did a whole video with tips for overwriters where you write way too much and you have to figure out how to trim and focus, but this is the opposite problem. You draft really, really lean. You wrote your book and it's only 30,000 words and you're like, it's a novella, but no, it's, it's a novel. What do I do? Or hey, perfect for nano. Fun fact, in most cases, 50,000 words is not a novel. It is in some genres, categories, but you have to expand far beyond 50,000 words for it to be a meaty, novel. So what do you do? I actually have even more tips for this one than overwriters. And at first I thought it was going to be the opposite. I tend to overwrite. So I was like, I can give tons of advice for overwriters. I have experience. But then I really challenged myself to think about underwriting and think about underwriting in my own work. I have had some books that when I thought about it, yeah, they were 70,000 words, but they ended up much longer. So clearly parts of them were underwritten. So I was able to draw on some of my experiences with the Ivies, which is the one that I'm thinking of, but also critique partnering and betaing and mentoring some slightly shorter books where I did have to give tips on fleshing things out. And so without further ado, I'm just going to jump right into it. So underwriters, this one is for you. But actually to that point, I did mention in the overwriting video that sometimes even overwriters can underwrite sections of their books. So I think both of these videos are helpful for everyone. So my first big tip to underwriters is to really think about how much internalization you have on the page. You probably have very little. That's a very clear and obvious place to skimp when you are underwriting, fast drafting. And internalization means like feelings, thoughts, character reflection. If you just go from plot point to plot point, action to action, you're inevitably going to be lacking these things. But first I want to talk about it on a scene level. You need to look for opportunities where things happen and your character just bumps along and never stops to reflect, like not even a line. And that's the thing. This can just be a line here and there every once in a while, a paragraph of how are they feeling? What are they thinking? Always bearing in mind, of course, you're not just vomiting extra stuff onto the page. This should align to their character wants, their character needs, the overarching as well as sub conflicts, stakes, etc. But adding these little moments of character reflection, reaction, maybe even little lines of backstory flashback, these are going to do so much work for your book to help the reader connect to your characters, really care, and it's just going to generally flesh out and beef up your book. In particular, and I am going to go into more detail about these as bigger scenes rather than just like little moments, but if you're writing a romance or a mystery arc in particular and you don't don't have these things. And if you fast drafted an underwritten draft, you probably don't definitely add them. The readers expect a character involved in a romance or a mystery or similar to stop and think about what is going on semi regularly. So to that end, the next question you ask yourself, is your book all A plot and no B plot or very little B plot and definitely no C plots? Well, you gotta add those and they're not easy. I in fact have avoided making videos on A plots, B plots, etc. because I find them trickier to talk about, easier to talk about with a specific book. But in essence, your A plot is your main plot. The character starts here, goes here and ends here. You should have a B plot. You should have subplots, things that happen in and around your main plot, they all feed together. You shouldn't have extraneous subplots, but inevitably underwritten books lack enough subplots. I've definitely seen underwritten drafts that are all A plot and no B plot. And in particular, I've seen this in thrillers. And when you have that kind of thing, it's like, well, great. Yeah, technically they bumped along and did a thing, but it was way too easy. That is the essence of this problem. Think about what happens in your book, your 30,000, 40,000, 50,000 word book from start to finish. It's probably too easy. There's not enough conflict. You don't have subplots. Subplots thrive off of conflict. Things happening that make things challenging or difficult 
obstacles to overcome, new places to go to, new information to glean from, new things to react to, thinking about those emotional reactions. So concrete tips on what to do if you realize you're all a plot. Adding a B-plot in many books is as simple as adding a romance plot. Romances are very, very commonly B-plots in non-romance books. Romance books, of course, your A-plot is your romance. Speaking specifically to thrillers, one of my favorite genres, often in addition to a romance subplot, you also get your investigation subplot. That is the B-plot in one, because often the investigator character who forms the B-plot, the person who helps the main character to do things on the side from the main arc, is often also the romantic interest. They don't have to be, but that's a very easy solution. So let's say you have a mystery story, and you have your investigator, and they come in, and a, there's a murder, and you bump them along through the plot, Add a foil character who they have a little bit of romantic chemistry with for some reason. They insert themselves and have a reason, a good reason, to help that main character investigate. That thread is your B-plot. You're inevitably going to be complicating, in a good way, your act two so that more things happen. There's more misdirection. Don't be afraid of misdirection. You should have purposeful threads, particularly in that middle of your book, where your characters do go on detours. They feel reasoned in the moment. You always need like a foundation for why a thing is happening. Again, you don't just add stuff willy-nilly to make your book longer. But it's maybe not the right direction, but it inevitably points them in the right plot direction. That's what subplots do. And B plots in particular should intersect with the A plot thoughtfully. C plots, D plots, those additional subplots, those can dead end, as long as they dead end in a way that still acts to propel your character toward back toward the B or the A plot. The next thing to think about, and it actually kind of ties in here, do you have characters that you introduce early in your book and they just totally disappear? Either completely from the book, they never show up again, or they show up in Act 3, but they're gone for like a massive chunk of the book. I see this most often happen with characters like parents, friends, colleagues. Now, in some cases, you have an extraneous character who doesn't need to be in your book at all. But in other cases, you have actually handed yourself those subplots that you need to add to your book. Think about how to take those characters that you have set up in the beginning, and then they disappear. Why do they disappear? Oh, my character doesn't need them to do this thing. Well, then you're going to invent a reason for that character to come back and do something with your main character that's still going to tie into the main plot. So for example, let's say it, it's a YA. Oh, it doesn't have to be a YA, but let's say it's a parent character and you have them in the beginning for, for setup and establishing character and maybe some light conflict and stakes, but then they disappear. You can add in a subplot. Give that parent a reason to come back in act two once, twice, maybe more, and actively create issues for the main character. This can work across genre. In something like YA, it's going to be more obviously, let's say the parent shows up and is like, why are you sneaking out of the house? And they ground them and it's a conflict that the character has to work around to get back to the main plot. Maybe it's a subplot of them learning to stand up to their parent or what have you in a different genre where, you know, the parent, where everyone's an adult. Maybe it's a subplot with uh, the parent is uh, just more and more forgetful. And suddenly you have a character who has to deal with a parent where something's wrong. Maybe they have dementia or something else. And maybe, of course, you come up with a clever plot twisty thing that it's not dementia and it, it somehow <laughs> subverts expectations to tie into the main plot. It really could be anything to bring those side characters in to give them something to do in the book. Another really great example, friends. This happens a lot. You establish them in the beginning because normal humans have friends, and so you want to have the character feel grounded in a social world. Then the friends disappear because they don't have to do with the main plot that you're writing. Again, find a reason to use them. I've seen this in thrillers or mysteries, again, that have mostly A plots and very few B plots. Use that friend character as the investigation sidekick. Give that friend character 
access to something or a piece of information, I mean, you could use this in sci-fi, you could use this in fantasy, that is critical to the main plot, but it becomes a subplot pulling that character in and giving them a reason to interact with your character more. And you're going to have to write all of that extra material. So let's say you have a mystery plot, whether it's in a mystery thriller, sci-fi, or a fantasy. Well, all of a sudden, the friend character you introduced but didn't really use, what if they work at the bank and all of a sudden you're like, uh -huh, I could use this in my heist plot. Maybe I had had it part of my A plot where there's this convoluted way that they accomplish this thing I'd already written. Well, if I change it to the friend having that access, well, now I have to thread that friend better through the book so that when we get to there, they don't just show up out of nowhere to help the character solve a problem. You're adding word count to your book then. You are adding a subplot with a character who's going to be critical to a plot point that already existed. And this brings us back to that question you asked yourself, is everything too easy? Do things happen too easily? Is it very convenient that everything in the A plot just happens? Again, you're going to use these sub characters, whether they were introduced early and you figure out a way to use them or brand new characters you can invent to create subplots and subplots that introduce conflict. Generally underwritten books simply lack enough conflict. Usually. There can also be the case where your story is jam-packed full of conflict, but you're missing all of that in-between stuff, the reflective moment, so it's possible that that first tip solves all your problems and you just add word count by adding a ton of reflection. But it's also possible that things are too easy, not enough happens, and that's why your book is so short. And generally, the solution to this is what we just talked about. It's taking characters who disappeared, creating new characters, and basically throwing them in the path of your main character to create problems. Or in some cases, solve problems, but inevitably, what's fun is by finding new solutions to something, you have a new variable, it'll often create new conflicts and issues. Like, for example, that friend helps with the bank heist, but let's say that friend gets caught and all of a sudden their life is ruined and you have a friend fight. I trust you authors to come up with much better examples than these ones I have on the fly. Part of things being too easy is you have to challenge yourself in terms of that main character and that A plot and really think about the choices you've made. And sometimes this can mean really rejigging something in your character, in your setup, in order to add more complication, more subplots, even if it means a bit of a change. So the example I can give you for this, for the Ivies, it was, so the draft was like 70,000 words, 74,000 words, which doesn't sound underwritten. But what I ultimately ended up doing in the final book is about 85,000 words in part because of these changes. But I had had something in my setup, in my main character, where I had her go into the main thrust of the mystery with a lot of knowledge, a lot of very specific knowledge. In that particular plot, her friend is murdered and she hones right in on a reason and she's like, it must be this. Of course, there are lots of subversions of reversals that were in the book. But at my editor's suggestion, she was like, what if Olivia, your main character, knows a little less about this other thing that is a given in the first draft? If she knows less about that thing, she's gonna have to find out <laughs> all of those things that you had her know originally. And it added a whole subplot to the second act that really added texture. It helped the pacing and the tension because all of a sudden, instead of just one arc, there was a whole other one I had to layer on top of it. And the pacing goes this to the character finding out new things. There was all this new stuff for her to react to because instead of kind of knowing something and being a little kind of embittered to that thing that she knew, now I had to factor in shock, shame, guilt, anger. Think about what is too easy for your character in your underwritten draft. And if you change one little thing about their perspective, about their knowledge, their relationship with a particular character, all of a sudden you have new conflicts and subplots to layer into the story. The main 
thrust. My main A plot and B plot didn't change, but I essentially added, I fleshed out the B plot and kind of added a C plot. So another thing that underwriters tend to do, like they talk about it, they admit it, is they draft the book and they write all the scenes they want to write. They write all the fun, exciting scenes and they'll skip what I hear them refer to as the boring scenes. So here's where I challenge you underwriters to rethink those boring scenes because if you find them boring and you don't want to write them and I call these scenes functional filler it feels more like filler they are inevitably a little less exciting than the exciting scenes they might be those reflective scenes those emotional breathing moment scenes they're less exciting so it is more fun to write an argument than it is to write the reflection after the argument or the dark moment after someone dies but your book isn't complete without that and that often is what is missing in an underwritten draft that is all plot 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 action exciting fun scenes so first you have to write those scenes I mentioned the emotional reflection and reaction within existing work, but you might have to add entire scenes or entire chapters or possibly even many subplots to have those moments. And if you're like, oh, I don't want to write that. It's like boring. It feels like filler. You have to find ways to make it more exciting. It shouldn't feel boring or like filler to you because if it feels like that to you to write it, two things. You either just have to like get better at writing them I've gotten better at writing those scenes over time, in part by finding ways to make them more exciting, but two slash B, if you find it boring, your reader will too. But that doesn't mean you get to skip those moments. <laughs> so my tip here is to identify where you need them, look at your story, beat out your story, use the Blake Snyder beat sheet and see what is missing, and then find interesting places to set those scenes that you weren't previously excited to write. Give an interesting element to the weather or the scenery, the architecture, fashion. I mean, we're about to talk about description. Find something that makes you excited to write the scene. Read some of your favorite moments of emotional catharsis from books and think about what excited you about those scenes. Those are functional filler scenes and you have to find ways to write them because just adding functional filler, if that is what you were lacking, that's probably 10,000 words added to your draft or possibly more. So yeah, are you lacking description? This is possibly another problem you have as an underwriter. It really depends on the kind of underwriter you are, but this tip might solve a lot of problems for you as well. First, really take yourself to task. Do you have white room syndrome? White room syndrome is where basically your characters when they are talking and doing things might as well be in a white room because you don't describe anything. You do not anchor any of those scenes in kind of spatial relations. You never kind of give the reader a sense of where they are, wh where physically, what physically they are doing. Are they touching things? Are they sitting? Are they standing? Are they walking? Is there weather? You give them very little to kind of hold on to add all of that stuff. It doesn't mean become a purple prose scenery chewing writer. But it does mean you go scene to scene and really think about, have I described this well enough? Can people visualize where they are and what is happening with the what is happening? Let's say it's a dot. You have a lot of dialogue scenes. Is it all dialogue tags? Very few action tags that are going to anchor the reader physically in this space so that they can create a mental image. Do you have a scene start? And in, here's the thing you have all the visuals in your head. They just haven't made them onto the page. Let's say you know that the character starts on one end of the room standing by a table and they, by the end of it, they've crossed the room and they're sitting on a settee. But if the only thing that makes it onto the page is at it randomly in the middle of the scene, she sat down on the settee, the reader's like, from where? Where were they? What is this space? You gotta add that. So another thing that if you have skimped on it and it's just not your favorite thing to do, you can learn to enjoy it. You gotta add all of that specificity of detail. I highly recommend you become friends with Pinterest. You become friends with images because th this is my cheat for adding very specific detail. I actually enjoy writing very specific detail to be fair. Think about in all of those scenes and settings and places, 
What's the architecture? Think about the five senses. How does it smell? How does something feel? Obviously, what does something look like if that if visuals are your go-to? It can be a breeze on someone's skin. Fashion. Describing what people are wearing or how the clothes in their body feel. These are great little details that you can add to something that are going to flesh out your narrative and just give the reader more to chew on. And the thing is, don't think of adding all of this description, adding all of these, the sensory details as filler. I think that some underwriters are like, oh god, that's just so frustrating. All description should be functional as well. Description should be a reflection of your character, your POV character, the lens through which you're telling the story. The details that you choose to share should say something about character, they should say something about the world, and you can also use them to add to and drive conflict. Even if it's micro-conflict, like maybe the dress material is scratchy and then just that just adds a little detail, maybe a detail that's important, maybe a detail that isn't important, but it definitely added something, some kind of attention to the scene while also adding visual specificity or sensory specificity. Again, it's not about going overboard, but a little bit goes a long way. Go through your whole manuscript and look for these little opportunities. And even if you're only adding 5,000 words across a 50,000 word manuscript, if you're also doing this alongside all that other stuff, next thing you know, you have a novel. So next I am going to just pepper you with questions slash suggestions for things that possibly might be your problem as an underwriter going basically structurally through a novel. So first, the beginning. Are you starting in the right place? Have you started right on action? Have you thrown the reader straight into the inciting incident? Well, maybe you need to add a little bit of buildup. It's okay to have a bit of buildup to the exciting thing that happens in the book. The beginning of the book should essentially establish the status quo of your world, of your character, the way things are, also what that character wants, so that when you throw in that thing, that crazy thing, that inciting incident, the thing that makes things change, the reader has enough to grasp onto, to care, but also so that they kind of know the basics so that as you move through the book, you're not dragging your pacing in other parts of the book by bringing up info dumping or backstory. So this means looking for opportunities right at the beginning of your book that actually allow the reader to settle into your world, settle into your characters, and so you can add some scenes or possibly even chapters before your inciting incident or even after. There should be stuff that happens after the inciting incident, but before the break into two, that is where your character is going to make a choice that propels them into the main action of the book. That can also be a place to add emotional reflection. Uh, establishing scenes with some of those characters that you maybe dropped later or you've added so that you can use them for subplots. Essentially, anything that's going to be important later in the book, you do have to find a way to work it into Act 1. So really hone in and think about is your pacing essentially too fast in your first act? Breakneck pace is good in a book, but usually in other spots in the book. I talked about moments of reflection. I talked about subplots. I talked, well, I mentioned subplots and investigations. This is a great place to discuss red herrings and reversals. These are momentary setbacks. These are things that, get, that are going to happen in your act two, starts and stops, where a promising direction happens and then it's like, oh no, that is not the right thing. And these are aspects of adding subplots, conflicts, etc. So in act two, you should have a bunch of these little things happen. It shouldn't be too easy to go from the break into two to your midpoint. So that's going to be something big that shifts in the middle of the book. It shouldn't be too easy to get there and it shouldn't be too easy after because there's stuff that happens after a big twist in the middle and your climax. There's actually a lot of stuff that happens between your twist in the middle and your climax. And I think a lot of underwritten projects skip a lot of that. And that is where your subplots and extra conflicts and characters are going to come in handy. So for example, let's say you have a romance and your big middle twist is a betrayal. It shouldn't go straight from the betrayal. Maybe your character reflects a tiny bit, but then there's a climactic escalation and a happily ever after. You skipped a lot of stuff. You need subplots. You need 
other people who are meddling in things. You need other things for your character to focus on as they barrel toward that break into three and then the climax. I know a lot of this structure-y stuff is like, what? So I will link below to some videos where I talk about structure. I particularly have done this in relation to thrillers and romances because that is where I have the most experience and those might help you know some of like all that stuff that you're supposed to have in your act too. But a reversal essentially and not having enough of them means you don't have enough moments in act two. It's basically building tension. It comes to a point and then it recedes and then you build tension again. There should be lots of those kinds of exciting stops and starts. Readers want those things. They don't want it to be too easy. But it also shouldn't be, by the way, maybe you have just like awful thing, awful thing, awful thing, because you can't have too much conflict, so to speak. That's where you're missing those reflective moments or like little moments of win. After something, you have a setback, you should have some kind of moment of triumph, reversals. You reverse kind of the mood and the feeling. So just essentially make sure you have enough of a push and pull, an emotional tug going through your act too. Enough things need to happen. So I already mentioned like, do you jump right from your midpoint to your climax? Consider that because there's a major beat that has to, well, there's a lot of beats, but there's one major beat that has to come between that. And this might mean you and underwriter need to study story structure a bit. It's called the break into three. So there is going to be that kind of moment that again is going to propel the main character to make some kind of choice or do something that inevitably propels them toward the climax. So you need to make sure that you have that moment and very often it's actually the work of the subplots that is going to create that. Most often it is the B plot. What I've seen in some underwritten books, the ones that are all A plot and not enough B plot, is technically that moment exists but it's not supported enough. It feels too easy. And thus basically everything happens too fast and the climax is going to feel unearned. Speaking of the climax, after the climax comes the finale, and I have harped on this in many, many videos. Many people underwrite this section of the book. You can also tragically overwrite it. Endings are very, very hard, but this is an emotional reflection moment. Really look at your finale, your climax going into your finale. Have you written a scene or a chapter, a moment? Heck, sometimes it's just a couple of meaty paragraphs where your character breathes. They let out the breath they didn't know they were holding. The reader needs this. This is actually for the reader, but you do it through the character. You have to have that moment, that beat, that scene, that chapter to let out a breath, a reflecting moment. You're tying up loose ends and then you can have your beautiful, sunny, wonderful finale scene. But I very often find that this moment, which I call the denouement, is missing in underwritten manuscripts in rushed endings. So my last tip, same as it was for the overwriters, you can't do this all by yourself. Give your book to someone else. Now my overwriters were going to ask their critique partners to tell them when they were bored. Now it's possible that same question can help you as an underwriter. It's possible you've chewed the scenery in some places and don't have enough of something else, but more likely the questions that are going to help you when you're getting feedback from other people on your underwritten project. You need to ask them where things feel rushed, where they were confused about character emotions. Like how did the character go from here to here? You're missing emotional beats or kind of logical support. Really anything where they tell you uh, a relationship felt too easy, insta love, uh, just a romance happening too easily, a mystery solved too easily, ask them if, if they guess the twist. Any book that has any kind of mystery thread, ask them those questions. Ask them to even check in with you as they're reading, to give you their reactions as they're reading, what they're feeling, what they're thinking, their guesses for what's happening. If any of that's too easy, regardless of what your book is, romance, fantasy, sci-fi, etc. If they are telling you, oh, I bet this is what's going to happen and they are bang on, correct? Your book is too easy, doesn't have enough conflict. 
Also ask them what characters uh, did they notice disappeared? What characters did they like but they felt like they didn't get enough from? That can give you really good clues of like who you were underutilizing. Maybe you set them up really, really well, but then they disappear. I generally, with critique partners, like to ask them to give me <laughs> questions like, any question they had while reading, I want it. This is gonna help you whether you are an overwriter or an underwriter, but especially for an underwriter, this can help show you what is missing. Because I think something that happens with underwriting, whether you are an underwriter or an overwriter, because you can underwrite parts of your manuscript either way, we take for granted details and things because we hold in our heads everything that's going on, everything about the characters. It's very obvious to us and we can skip putting that on the page because we're so excited by the story, because we want to get it done. Maybe it's intentional that you're dirty drafting and underwriting. Maybe it's unintentional that you skipped over a, a whole backstory, for example, perhaps, and so a character's motivations just don't make sense. But you can use critique partners to kind of zero in on what is missing and then it's your job to add that stuff to the story. And another thing that's come up in some of my other videos, and I'll link down below to an entire video on it, narration versus dramatization can also come up a ton in underwriting. It's possible you're going a little heavy on narration, which is when you kind of matter-of-factly say what happens to move the story along, but you don't have enough dramatization. Overwriters can of course have the opposite problem. Maybe you just have like a quick narrated line and there's an opportunity there to have an entire dialogue scene to kind of add richness and conflict to something. Is it too easy that they go from point A to point B with nothing in between? You can look for opportunities to basically add scenes and chapters where previously you maybe had like a couple of lines to move the story along. Definitely look for those opportunities. And even just on a micro level, because you just, you literally need to add more to the book. Maybe it's a line, they kissed. Describe the kiss, what led up to it, how it felt in it. I mean, kissing's awkward to write, but like think about character emotions. Really, I think it all comes back to character, POV, and lensing. Inevitably, if your book is underwritten, you probably don't have enough of the character, of their observations, of their feelings, really the lens through which you are telling the story. It should feel like their story, they should feel fleshed out as a character, and all the characters around them should feel that way as well. And that includes making sure that there is enough conflict and stakes to what is going on, that the reader feels the push and the pull. Always think about the emotional reading experience. Books that are essentially too quickly paced, which is often the thing with underwritten work, you don't get the emotional experience of reading that you want. There isn't enough tension because there isn't enough push and pull and in between. I hope this helped. If you are an underwriter, I hope I sparked an idea, something that you can look at, something that you can try. And definitely check out my overwriters video because it's possible you're overwriting some sections but underwriting others and vice versa. I hope there are overwriters watching this as well. These are lots of different solutions to different problems that you can either have overall with a manuscript or kind of on a micro level in bits of your manuscript. Let me know down below in the comments if you have any questions. If you are an underwriter or you're very familiar with helping underwriters, I would love to hear some of your best tips and tricks for tackling underwriting and give this video a thumbs up if you like it and I will make more kind of instructional discussion style videos about craft and if you're not already subscribed to the channel go ahead and do that. I post new videos two to three times a week. As always guys thank you so much for watching and happy writing!